Good afternoon and welcome to a session on rural mobility and the role of e-bikes. This is going to be a very practical guide. Um, so just to kick off first, my name's Jenny Milne. Some of you have probably come across me in very different places because I wear so many different hats. Um, I'm doing a part-time PhD at the University of Aberdeen on rural mobility as a service. Um, I'm also the founder of the Scottish Rural Islands and Transport Community, SRITC. And when I'm not doing all of that, I also uh, chair a small group on the International Transport Forum to do with rural innovation. Um, and that also takes into consideration shared mobility. I'm also on the uh, committee for the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport from Scotland. And I also run my own independent freelance. So there you go. I'm a jack of all trades, probably a master of none, but very much passionate about rural. So today, instead of talking about policy, because others are going to talk about that, I want to tell you about my experience um, of e-bikes, but also um, some other local communities and other projects that have taken, have happened to inspire you as to what you could do, or what other people can do. So when we think about e-bikes, there's usually quite a lot of questions that we ask ourselves. Mainly, who owns an e-bike? Why do we have them? Where can we use e-bikes? Can we take them for commuting purposes? What type of terrain do we have? Um, can they work on stony little paths in rural areas versus being on a road? How can we use them? Are we going to be using them for commuting purposes? Um, is it practical to commute? Where do we leave them? How do we store them? They cost a lot of money. What do we do with them? Would it replace the journey that I would do by foot or by car? All these questions start going subconsciously and consciously through our minds. And obviously the use of an e-bike is very different in a rural setting to an urban setting. So I'll get onto that in a minute or two. Um, how old do you need to be? That's a question for you. I'd love to know what you think on that. Um, I'm actually going to tell you just now, but you probably put it in the chat already. But you've actually got to be 14 years and over. Um, and a lot of people sort of don't realise that the younger generation, i.e. I've got a son who's 11, who would desperately love to be riding an e-bike, can't. So you need to consider that one. How do we charge them? Now, this is actually one of the challenges I'm going to talk about later on because they're not interchangeable charging um, units. It's a bit like how we used to have mobile phones or used to have different ends uh, for charging. So that can cause a problem. You have to make sure, therefore, that you carry the charger with you because if you don't carry it with you, you might be a bit stuck. It doesn't take that long to charge, I promise you. It's not um, like talking 12 hours or anything like that. You can do it in minutes and you can do it in less than hours. So that's my next question. How long does it charge? And my reason for my vague, vague answer was because it depends on how fast you go and how much you use and what the terrain's like. Um, how fast do you want to go really is the question. How much do they cost? Well, at the moment, that's a $60 million question, as is how soon can I get one? But how many of you actually have one? Please do put in the chat if, um, who's got one. I've loaned one, I don't own one. So um, probably a big difference to that as well. So who's using them? So I'm gonna tell you about my experience. Um, the bike you can see here came from Home Energy Scotland through Energy Saving Trust. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about the practicalities of my experience. And it is all in a rural context, as you can see from um, the pictures here. So. Um, I'm a leisure cyclist. I do cycle from time to time uh, out with the family and I do time to time take um, the bike to a coffee meeting with a work colleague um, or to local destinations. But the road infrastructure doesn't really allow me to be using it as a, as a serious um, proposition or so I thought. Um, when I went to collect the bike, I'm an outdoors person, I've got a tow bar. Now this is a heavier bike than some of you may have experienced, but one thing to consider is that when you put it on um, a, a bike carrier, which in my case, as I say, was on a tow bar, you probably could only get one or at a push two legally on the, the tow bar due to weight. So just consider that as, a, as an option, that if you're going to be using it as a bike that you want to take here, there and everywhere in the back of a car, you need to consider the weight capacity. Um, the, the speed on a bike, for those of you that have never been on it, is definitely and obviously much faster than that on a pedal bike. I was quite blown away. I was, without really trying, up to sort of the 30 uh, mile an hour sort of speed limit. Um, and 
that actually made me feel safer on my rural roads where there's wagons going at a ridiculous speed past me and motorbikes because I wasn't going the sort of 10 miles an hour or whatever it would be that I would normally be at. So because I was moving faster, I was able to sort of feel like I wasn't holding the traffic up and they could get past me easier. So that was that was one observation I had. And uh, some people are going to disagree with me, I'm sure. Um, going to a meeting. Now, this is an interesting one. I did a couple of meetings um, and instead of taking my car in different locations and I, I did use the path on the right hand side here um, to go to one of them. Um, normally seven miles and the person I was meeting, we both left at the same time. They were in a car, I was on the e-bike. They stayed on the main road. I took different tracks and then came onto the main road. By the time they then got there, found the parking space parked up, literally there was one minute difference in the time it took us to get to the meeting. And I was really quite surprised at that. And obviously I could get parked um, quite easily. And I had my chain with me. Um, and as you can see on the bike, there was also a lock as well. So that was all put together and I felt really safe. Um, I did that on a number of occasions. Um, and again, the difference was no more than two or three minutes. So it really does start to raise the question of when would you use the car versus an e-bike? Um, and you do have to think about the safety aspect predominantly for me. So off-road versus road. This, this bike wasn't designed to be a purely off-road bike and it wasn't designed to be a purely on-road bike either. Um, the picture to the left is really genuinely quite hilly and we came all the way up the hill there. Um, great to have that extra assistance going up. Now you can get a bike obviously that does both road and uh, off-road. If you start looking at the serious off-road you're looking at much bigger money and you're probably of a different uh, type of person to me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I'd take this regularly to do that sort of uh, off-road steep um, adventures but it definitely on the path on the right um, wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so that's, that, that's a true rural experience that's for sure. Um, I've mentioned about the safety with wagons. I Genuinely, I felt safer on the e-bike than I did even going out with my son on his pedal bike um, because of the, the speed that I could carry. Um, I wouldn't say they gave me any more space on the road, but I definitely felt that wee bit, wee bit safer. Did have a few practicality issues. Um, the bikes are obviously expensive and during the situation that we're in at the moment, very sought after, so highly desirable. Um, I didn't find a huge amount of secure storage, it has to be said, for first and uh, last mile. Um, I wasn't going to train stations, that has to be said, where you'd expect to find more secure storage. But it is something that we should be looking at uh, in rural communities, is how can we make people feel safe as a visitor or as a regular user of an e-bike for storing, storing that bike. Keys. Um, some of you uh, within EST will have heard me and keys don't go too well being dyslexic. Um, you do need to keep them safe and sound somewhere and don't lose them or misplace them. Um, so find a way and a method to keep that together. You can see on the bike that there's a display here and it does give you your speed and a lot of other sort of information if you want. And there is also um, a, a nice way to be able to securely put parcels, etc., on the back of your bike. Um, am I converted? Yes, probably I am. Um, I wouldn't say that it is a deterrent for me, but it's not a massive deterrent. Not being able to transport it on the back of um, two or more. So we're a family of three. If two had e-bikes and one was a pedal bike, we would be over the weight limit on um, our tow bar for, for carrying. So I'd need to look at getting a lighter lighter bike. So that's the only deterrent for me is the weight on the weight on the, the tow bar. Um, as I say, I think we need to investigate lighter bike. So I want to give you a couple of ideas of other locations uh, of what they're doing. And this one is in Aberdeenshire. They're zero carbon Daviant. Um, and just a, a, a few fun pictures for your afternoon. This has been very driven um, by the community and it has all come from the community and volunteers. It is a rural area. It is about 15 miles north of Aberdeen and about four miles north of Inverurie. And all of this has come from volunteers within the community. They've been helped out by the Huntley Development Trust with the lending of two e-bikes and then they got some from um, EST as well. The project only started in April, uh, as I say, with the two e-bikes, 
but they've had incredible results. They've kept a log of who's taken the bikes and when. They've not only been securely um, put into the shed, but that's beside the local shop. And when I say the shop, um, it's a lovely cafe as well. Um, they give you maps and they give you guidance and they'll help you out with what to do with your e-bike and where to go. And pretty much most days since the 28th of April, they have been rented out, um, which is fantastic news. Um, and people have even been so impressed that eight have gone and bought their own e-bikes. And that's in a really short space of time for a community that only has a couple of hundred people in it. So you can make an impact and you can get out there and find funding and support to be able to make it happen um, in your area. They are now looking at getting funding to purchase their own bikes and then they're going to use some funding to be able to get some lockups and also to buy some helmets and high vis that people may not have. But it's been a great success in the local community. And in fact, when I tried to go and hire one out to go to a meeting, um, I was told that I had to wait 10 days before I could get access to one. So um, you can do it. Um, the, the, the gang there at Davia are more than happy to speak to you and help you out so if you want contact details then please just ask or pass them on. Another one that you may have seen in, in the press is the what I call the Highland story. This is um, partly funded by EST again and uh, is part of a European project called Inclusion and they had some pilot areas in Granton and Spey, Aviemore and Fort William and they had six bikes in each location. And the key to this was actually working with local partners. And as you can see here in, in the pictures, Mike Bikes and Aviemore was one of them. Um, obviously, the programme slightly changed as COVID started. Um, it was meant to start in April last year. Uh, and instead of being to visitors um, and residents at the beginning of the project, it was very much long term loans to key workers. Um, so great adaption here. And as you can see, they've had a good uptake, 105 users in Aviemore. 236 in Granton and 41 in Fort William. When they re uh, evaluated the, the project here, um, they discovered that people enjoyed replacing the e-bike for what would traditionally have been a car journey, a pedal bike, or just by going foot. Um, and some of the stories that um, you can read about show how somebody that didn't really cycle before, uh, didn't have the confidence to cycle, tried the e-bike out and is completely converted. So there are, there are options out there. And the reason for highlighting this project is that it's been funded by High Trans, uh, Highland and Islands Transport Regional Authority and is working in partnership with other organisations in local areas. So maintenance and hiring is very much in the community and supporting the community. So very practical um, and very much a, a success story as well. So partnership is key. So how do we make e-bikes accessible? in rural areas and to me accessibility is about availability in rural areas. We need to work as High Trans have done and Davit have done and many others out there, there's Loch Lomond and various other locations I could have highlighted but for time purposes I couldn't. We need to work and deploy with local communities because they know the demand and the needs of what people need and want in their area. And that partnership, I can't underestimate that. Um, within SRITC, we see regularly people working with communities, users and local authorities, and that's when we have the success stories. Um, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of energy, but you need that passion and drive, which is why um, us in the rural areas, we know what we want. You've also got the ability to introduce the sharing schemes in the communities, as an example, um, and that, that does help, gives you a bit of a taste, a bit of an insight, isn't overly committed. And there are many organisations out there, not just EST, that can help you with these things. Um, quite often, when we're talking about communication um, about e-bikes or any transportation, to be honest, um, a lot of it is left to social media. Not everybody in rural areas has access to internet or is indeed interested in social media. So you have to really think long and hard about your communication strategy um, so that you can bring people on that journey with you rather than just turning up and um, dumping in inverted commas um, a product such as an e-bike because the community won't know what they are, they won't know why they're there. Um, so really think long and hard about how you're going to communicate um, the deployment and accessibility of your e-bikes. I've touched on it earlier, we need to really look at how we create um, secure storage and charging points. Um, e-bikes are only practical and usable 
and accessible if we have these services available. Uh, I'll give you an example. Earlier this year, Cycling Scotland provided a grant for accommodation providers in north of Scotland so they could help develop um, uh, secure bike storage at sites so that people could go on holiday with pedal bikes or e-bikes. So this is sort of joined up thinking that we need to see going forward. And nearly at the end, um, suggestion, we talk about these green prescriptions that GPs can go out there and help people that are um, recovering from illness and with two family members particularly that have been ill over the last two years. Um, the e-bike to them has been something that they hadn't thought of and when I've discussed it with them, both living in rural areas, they're like, oh, maybe I should try this. Maybe I need to speak to my GP to see if that would help my recovery. So do we want to look to maybe a policy whereby um, e-bikes could become part of the green prescription? So that's me just about there. Um, you'll be wondering what these pictures are, but they're all different types of pedal power. So the top one there is a pedal power, that is a pedal car. And at the bottom here is something called a, a hyperbike. Um, yes, I have horses as well, but this isn't mine. But this is another way of getting bikes out there on the back of Shetlands. So just to conclude and summarise, really, um, what do we need for the future? The practicalities need to be addressed. Um, and hopefully the policy conversations you're going to have as well will start to take that on board. We need to empower and equip communities to be able to take on these small pilots to bring people together to make this happen. But the question I'll leave for those uh, more experienced than me probably is what is the role of e-bikes when we're starting to look at combined mobility or even mobility as a service and we need to look further than just the UK for that. We need to see what people are doing overseas particularly within the rural setting um, because that's where you get your ideas from, that's where you get your lessons learned. So I hope that's provided some insight for you into some practicalities. It might have been a, a suck eggs situation for some of you that already have e-bikes and you strongly disagree with what I've said, but I just hope that's got the, the mind thinking and that we can have a chat later on. Enjoy the rest of the day.